Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JS Box Kraal harmonizations. Today we're looking at Das Valt Mein Gott, Vater, Sohn und Heiliger Geist, which translates to Thy Will Be Done, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Fairly straightforward chorale. There are a couple of interesting quirks to this particular chorale, I would say namely the modulation we have moving into the last leg of the chorale, and just the overall key choices in this chorale, uh, namely because we spend the majority of it in F major and then we pivot to D minor at the end, which brings into question the overall tonality of the chorale. This has been kind of a theme in the chorales we've been looking at recently, and even though, to be consistent with my previous analyses, um, the last cadence typically dictates the overall tonality of the chorale. You can't help but, you know, bring into question if the majority of the chorale is spent in one key, should that actually be the overall key of the chorale. All in all, really not too much to write home about otherwise, so we're just going to hop right into the analysis. So one flat in the key signature, we actually start on D minor. Now that I see that, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, and we end on D major, so you'd be thinking our overall tonality is D minor just from that observation, but we're actually starting in the key of F major here, and this is our sixth chord, and we immediately move to A, A, C, and F, which is our tonic triad and first inversion. Passing tone in the bass here before we get C, G, C, and E, that's C major, which is our five chord. A little passing tone here in the tenor and a brief neighboring seventh here in the tenor as well, before we get F, A, C, and F, which is our tonic triad and root position. This in and of itself sort of feels like its own little phrase, but for some reason, none of the additions that I saw included a fermata over this beat, so it just sort of stands on its own as like a subphrase. We move into the next leg of the phrase, F, C, F, and A. That's another F major chord we don't need to reanalyze. F, C, G and C. This F is most likely a lower suspension. E, C, G, and C is C major in first inversion, 5, 6. And that takes us to D, D, F, and B flat, which is B flat major over D, which is 4, 6. And that takes us to a subdivided chord here, E, C, G, and B flat, which is C7 over E, 5, 6, 5, which takes us presumably to 1, F, C, F and A, this G being a bit of a 9-8 suspension over the bass. 4-6 going to 1 in this ascending configuration will always have some type of connecting tone here. Typically it's the leading tone. Sometimes we see the subtonic 7th as well in minor keys, but usually speaking we have the leading tone connecting 4-6 to 1 when we see this uh, progression here of 4-6 going to 1 ascending like this, and that's been consistent across all of the chorales, one of the few things. We then have C, C, E, and G. This F is a 4-3 suspension over the bass, uh, making this a 5 chord. And actually, before we continue to analyze here, I think there are multiple ways to analyze this particular cadence. I'm on team half cadence for this particular uh, phrase due to the fact that the G feels like it wants to resolve down to F for me, rather than resolving down to C. Uh, coincidentally, it does go down to C on the next beat at the beginning of the following phrase, but I think there's an argument to be made that there's a quick pivot to C major at the end here because of this B natural. It does bring a lot of attention to C, but when we have tonicizations in a cadential context, you always uh, get a little bit of muddying in terms of what key you're in, especially if that's the first real reference to um, the key that you're tonicizing throughout the phrase. So I have this analyzed as a half cadence. If, the, if you analyze this as an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of C, I totally think that's valid as well. After our five chord, we have B, G, D, and G. It's a five, six chord of five G major over B is our dominant in the key of C. This F is a little um, suspension that's being prepared for the next beat, C, F, C, and G. It is a 4-3 suspension over the bass, and we cadence on 5 C major. So this would be a 1-5-6-1 cadence in the key of C major, but for me it just looks like a half cadence, and he's using a secondary dominant to articulate that. But moving ahead, we are going to stay in the key of F major, 
A, F, C, and C is our tonic triad, F major in first inversion. B flat, F, B flat, and D is our four chord, B flat major. We have some passing tones as well, which does, in my opinion, give us a subdivided chord progression, E.G. B flat, and B flat uh, is E diminished over B flat, so this would be like a 7-6-4 chord if the bass really plays a role. It's not, not super important because the bass really isn't moving here, but 4 going to 7, probably the most common subdivided chord progression, all of the chorales, and it resolves to a tonic triad, A, uh, a C, and F, which is F major in first inversion. We have a neighbor tone in the alto, a passing tone in the bass before we get B flat, A, D, and F, which is also an analyzable chord, and because we analyzed the previous subdivided beat, uh, might as well analyze this one. That would be B flat, major seven in root position. And um, because we're moving towards a cadential uh, situation here, four seven makes sense because it would sort of function as a predominant, but before going immediately to C, which is where we would expect it to resolve. That's where it goes in the bass. Um, we have C, G, C, and F. Oh, you know what? No, it does go to a C chord. It's just, I thought this was an F major chord in second inversion. No, this F is a 4-3 suspension in the... Uh, actually, there are a couple of different ways to analyze this. I think... Hmm. What's the best way to analyze this? I'm going to say that this is a 4-3 suspension because the F is being held from the previous beat and that this is actually a 5 chord with the passing tone in the tenor, but you could analyze this as a 1-6-4 uh, chord as well, C, A, C, and F. So really it's just pick and choose based on your situation or based on your, I guess, relationship with the harmony, but here I think it's a 4-3 suspension in the melody that resolves on the next beat uh, to C, B flat, C, and E, which is an incomplete uh, C7 chord. It doesn't have a G in there. Not that that's super important or anything, but um, I feel like it's worth noting because chords are more often than not complete. And then we get a perfect authentic cadence on F major, F, A, C, and F, our tonic triad. Okay, looking ahead, we have another half cadence in the key of F major, so no modulation just yet. You see what I mean here, that we spend the majority of our time in F major and only begin seeing different keys in the latter leg of the chorale. So I don't know really what the overall tonality is. I'll commit to D minor because that's the final key that we hear, but um, all in all, I think there's a strong argument for F being our overall tonality as well. Uh, we start the phrase off with F, F, A, C, and F, which is our tonic triad again. No need to reanalyze. Passing tones in the melody and the tenor before we get F, C, F, and A again, which is F major, another tonic triad. Now, the reason why I reiterate the Roman numeral in the new system is because I just want to create continuity between the uh, line break here. So if this f uh, measure continued on the same line, well, it would be off the page, but hypothetically speaking, if it did, I would omit the Roman numeral. But because we're on a new line, I'm just reiterating the Roman numeral more so as a courtesy to the reader and also for my own notes so that I don't think that like I neglected a, a harmony here. Uh, it's just a stylistic thing that I do. I don't think one way is right or one way is wrong. It's just what I choose to do. Uh, we have a lower suspension here again on beat 2, E, C, G, and G spells C major over E, which is 5, 6, and that takes us to F, C, F, and A, which is our tonic triad again, F major in root position, passing 7th in the bass, and then we get D, D, F, and B flat, which is B flat major in first inversion, 4, 6. Then we go to A, C, F, and C, which is our tonic triad in first inversion, F major over A, neighbor tone in the bass, then another F major over A again, no need to reanalyze, and then another non-chord tone in the bass, this time a passing tone, before we get C major, C, C, E, and G, which is our five chord in root position. Notice how the half cadence has the fifth of the chord in the melody. That's a typical expectation you can have about half cadences in Bach's chorales. Notice how the fifth of the chord is in this melody too. It's not always, but the majority of the time, I am a little hesitant to put a percentage on it, but um, oh, so I'm not going to, but the majority of the time you're going to see the fifth of the chord in the melody. That's not 
completely indicative of that being a half cadence, of course, because we're actually coincidentally going to see an imperfect authentic cadence here in the next phrase that ends with the fifth of the chord and the melody. But um, it's just something that's usually indicative of half cadences. So uh, regardless, we're going to get a mid phrase modulation here uh, going into our penultimate phrase to C major, and our phrase is going to end in D minor. So C is going to be our gateway to D minor. Kind of interesting because F is closer to D and typically modulation chains and box chorales follow this idea of moving to the key via the path of most um, closely related keys. Not always, but the majority of the time. So I think this C major chord is just going to elide with our next phrase. It's both five in the key of F and one in the key of C. We start the phrase off with G major over B. B, D, G, and G with the passing seventh and the alto. That's our five chord and first inversion. We then have C, C, E, and G, which is our tonic triad and root position. E, C, E, and G is just briefly taking our chord and putting it in first inversion before we get five again. G, B, D, and G, G major. Passing seventh in the bass. E, C, E, and G, that's another tonic triad, this time in first inversion. Passing tone in the bass, C, C, E and G, but we have this B flat here, what's going on? I would typically expect this to be five of four, but what actually this B flat is implying is that we're moving to the key of D minor. So I'm gonna call this our tonic in root position in the key of C major. And kind of interestingly, we're gonna be modulating over our flat seven here uh, in the key of D minor. We see Bach uh, modulate to uh, minor keys or out of minor keys using the flat seven with some frequency. Uh, but it's one of the lesser common chords that Bach uses to modulate. Typically, Bach uses more uh, more commonly used chords like you know tonics and fours and fives. Um, the flat seven does get used with you know some frequency, so um, it's not unprecedented by any means. But you know it's, it's it's something worth pointing out. I feel like more recently than not, Bach has been we've been seeing Bach use this a lot. So. Um, but don't get it twisted because uh, just because we've been seeing it recently doesn't mean that it's a uh, um, like like a super commonplace or anything. Uh, but that being said, we sometimes see a subtonic seven go to five, so seven functioning sort of as a predominant here. A C sharp E and A is A major in root position. That's our five chord. We have a neighbor tone and two passing tones. Passing tones in the lower voices and a neighbor tone in the alto before we get C sharp E A E and A which is just taking our five chord and putting it in first inversion. Kind of similar to the configuration we saw here in our previous phrase where we took the chord and just inverted it or just continued revoicing it uh, in the bass here. Actually not as similar as I thought. This is a common thing that Bach does though where he um, takes a chord and just keeps a voice or multiple voices static and revoices um, however many voices are moving um, without changing the quality or the um, the root of the chord. We have A and C sharp here. Those are both chord tones, so we don't need to mark them, but this G is a passing seventh, and then we cadence on D minor, D, F, D, and A. And like I mentioned, this imperfect authentic cadence has the fifth of the chord and the melody. That's kind of unusual. We typically expect the third of the chord and the melody. That's not a rule. Of course, I don't want to uh, uh, talk about it with the um, takeaway being that's uh, it's always going to be a third, but the majority of them are going to have the third of the chord and the melody. Um, and I think that that's more coincidental than anything else because it just indicates where the resolution wants to go moving forward. But unlike what we would expect, which would be D minor, then moving to F major again for a final cadence, Bach stays in the key of D minor. So we start off with a D minor chord, D, A, D, and F. No need to reanalyze. The C is natural, so we have a passing seventh here in the alto before we get D, G, B flat, and E. I think this D, I mean, you could make an argument this is a 2-4-2 two, two chord. Um, Bach sometimes resolves to a 5-6 chord here as well, um, where he subdivides the beat after a 2-4-2 two, two chord. But I think actually this D is a lower suspension, and it's like this C sharp being a... Uh, um, maybe like a like a nine ten suspension under or a what would it be yeah like a nine ten suspension under the melody or something because the C sharp feels a little bit more important than um 
the D as far as chord tones are concerned. So C sharp, G, B flat, and E. That's C sharp fully diminished seventh, which is seven seven in the key of D minor. And that takes us to D minor. This G being a four three suspension over the bass, we have F, F, A, and D. So the chord ends up resolving uh, to this F in the bass because the resolution occurs with the change in bass. Bach does this all the time where the bass changes by the time the suspension resolves. And that takes us to G, E, B flat, and D. This is very clearly a two chord, E minor seven flat five over G. Bach loves two six five chords, especially in cadential situations. And this E is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. We then have A, E, A, and C sharp, which is our five chord, A major. So two, six, five going to five, very staple, perfect, authentic cadential formula. This G is a late chordal seventh, but not a chord tone because it's happening off of the harmonic rhythm. And our final perfect authentic cadence concludes with D major, D, F sharp, A, and D. Bach often ends his minor chorales with a Picardy third. So that's pretty, pretty much expected. Not always, but pretty much expected. You could bet on the majority of the chorales in a minor key or chorales that end in a minor key um, to have a tonic major at the end of it. And that's pretty much the entire chorale for today. All in all, really not too much to talk about. We have this uh, mid-phrase modulation here where we start in one key and don't end in the same key. Uh, that's something that I've been tracking for my own curiosity. And the fact that we sort of just have this turnaround to a new key at the end, like we stay in F, there's no reason why we wouldn't expect this chorale to end in F, but it ends in D minor. So that's another interesting quirk about this particular chorale. But all in all, lots of one chords, lots of five chords, not a lot of harmonic diversity, but it's a very beautiful chorale, as the majority, as well, all of them are, but it's always interesting to see Bach write beautiful music with um, very simple means. But with all that being said, um, if you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel. You can hit the notification icon if you'd like to be notified of my daily upload, and you can like the video if you enjoyed the content. Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.